welcome to another edition of Connected TV. I'm your host, Tammy Lindy, bringing you interesting interviews, stories and bands from our great South East. Coming up on today's show, we have local artist Stella Gibbs sharing about her long history of Ipswich and her art. Managing Director of Jim's Pool Care, Brett Blair, joins us for some tips with Winter Pool Care. Later in the show, we'll give you a taste of the sights and sounds of the Ipswich Festival and hear from our musical guest, Rachel Mack, from the Wind Up Dolls. But first, my guest today is Ipswich City Councillor for Division One, David Morrison. Welcome to the show, David. Yeah, thanks, Tammy. Good to be here. Lovely to have you. I know you're yeah. a busy man. Yep. Listen, David, can you tell me, I know previously you were a teacher yep. in a past life, if we can say that. Yep, sure. What was the motivation behind your change from teaching to politics? Sure. Well, in teaching, you're always dealing with uh, families, with parents, with the community. Mm. And I was at the particular school I was at, Westside Christian College at Goodna, oh, for great. 10 years. Yep. And yeah, I loved the school, loved the job, but I was looking for a change. And I yeah. thought, with dealing with people all the time, yeah. I thought I'll put my hat in the ring for the local election in 2000 and was elected in 2000. That's brilliant. Yeah. Was it partly just the idea of, because of your interaction with people, was it that idea that you knew the needs of the community and so yeah. that you could speak on their behalf because you've yeah. been a member of the community for so long? Oh, definitely. Yeah, my parents came from Scotland when I was seven years of age. Wow. They uh, purchased two acres in Kamira when there was no power, no water, gravel wow. roads. So I grew up in the suburb of Kamira, which Springfield was yeah. part of and I've been there since I was seven. Wow. Taught in the Wide Bay area for five years, went to Bible college for a year, but came back. So, and my children were involved in the community and I was involved in the community. So yeah, yeah it went from there. Yeah, absolutely. So being a member of the community for so long, you would have seen a lot of growth and development through your time just living here and obviously being a counselor. Yeah, definitely. Can you tell me maybe some of, our, of the highlights you remember? Yeah. Well the, well, the highlight when I was growing up was when the grader went over the dirt road and it made it nice and smooth. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't such a bumpy road. But now the highlights, like I've seen the Centenary Highway come through to Springfield. Wow. I've seen every single part of Springfield being planned and developed. It's, uh, you know, to be part of that is something very special. Absolutely. Yeah. You were saying to me just before the show, actually, about the studio that we're here in today at yep. USQ Springfield. Yep. You remember this auditorium actually yep. having the cement stairs and yep. walking up them? Yep. Well, the road that leads down to this university, Sinathambi Boulevard, mm. I remember standing up on the hill at Springfield Green Bank Arterial before Sinathambi Boulevard was even created. Wow. And uh, with people from Springfield Land Corp, and yeah. they were saying there's going to be a university here within 12 months, and it was just a, a dust patch. Yeah. That's amazing. So in this very auditorium we're sitting in, I remember yeah. it being constructed. Remember sitting on the seats in front of us here wow. when they were just concrete forms. That's amazing. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what's your mission for Division One? What is your mission as a politician? What are you trying to achieve for the community going forward? Yeah, sure. I think anything in life, Tammy, there's, um, there's extremes. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in the middle of those extremes, there's the balance. So we've obviously got lots of uh, development mm -hmm. and uh, lots of trees that have got to be knocked down for that development. Mm -hmm. So I think basically in a nutshell, my mission is to achieve a healthy balance between the environment yep. and the development and make mm -hmm. sure we, we get the, the great value of both for, the, for this generation and for future generations. Yeah, that's brilliant, excellent. Yeah. Now we had Paul Pasali um, a few weeks ago uh, talking about obviously the growth in the, in the Springfield Corridor yep. and, and things like that. Can you yep. talk maybe a little bit about how that will actually affect this area and the Division 1 area with that exponential growth that's um, yeah, expected? Planned. Yeah, planned, yeah, sure. Certainly the state government and council have given approval for what we call the Greater Springfield area to, yeah. for 86,000 people to call this place home. Yeah. There's currently about 25,000 of those people here now, so wow. there's a lot more to come than have already come. And obviously this campus is expanding, it's duplicating in size to cater for that. So we've got to do everything in our planning as if the 86,000 people are here are now, because you don't get another chance to create more land. That's right. So we've got to protect sporting fields, we've got to create, we've got to protect open space, we've got to protect environmental corridors for the wildlife That's and brilliant. we've got one chance to do it and we do it right now. That sounds so exciting. Yeah. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for yeah. being on the show today, David. Pleasure. I'm really looking forward to the developments that are happening in the area. Yeah. Still to come on Connected, Stella Gibbs and Brett Blair. Stay connected.
welcome back. My next guest began her journey as an artist in 1984, with her main interest lying in pen and wash drawings of the many beautiful heritage buildings in Ipswich. Welcome to the show, Stella. Thank you. Lovely to Thank have you, you for here. having me. Now, with your particular style in the pen and wash, can you tell me a little bit about the, the style and what it entails and your background in it? Right. Um, as you said, I started quite early and I have improved a long way since then. <laughs> but I, I had my sister sent me a blank sketchbook and a rotary pen for my birthday. And then my husband bought me a book of Keith Norris's drawings and oh, I thought, nice. wow, that's so good. And for the next three years, I looked after my grandmother, who'd been a beautiful watercolour artist and learnt oh, from lovely. Elias Gruner, but she had dementia and with four small children and a 93-year-old grandmother, I didn't do any drawing. Yeah. And just before Nana died, I met a woman in a framing centre and uh, she, I was so inspired by her work. Her name was Patricia Gamblin, mm -hmm. and she did beautiful architecture and things. Oh, and because uh, she knew all the Gruners and the, you know, the Norman mm -hmm. Lindsay's and all the people <laughs> my grandmother had grown up with. And so Nana just beamed. Here was somebody who knew her world. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so we, 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 we constantly met every week for a cup of tea. Yeah. And, because Pat would pretend she hadn't heard the story before and Nana would tell the story and, <laughs> and she'd come home on a high for another week, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Now, yeah. I heard you mention architecture before. Was yes. that what started the love of, of obviously your beautiful drawings that you're well known for of the beautiful yes. heritage buildings in Ipswich? Is yes. Well, Keith something... Norris's book inspired me because I yeah. just thought, wow, you know, you can see the sticks on the grass and, and it's just that mm. lovely feeling of being there, that spirit yeah. of place that he could portray with just a pen. Yeah, it's, and, uh, it's a beautiful style. It is, yeah. and it goes with everything. You know, you can put it in a mm. lounge room or in anywhere. That's it's it. It's just so versatile. Mm. And you're mm. on a world stage, really, aren't you? You, you send uh, your paintings all over the world. Yes, I've had a lot of, um, a lot of commissions from overseas, and I've got... Um, Yes, most countries have got some of my work and it's surprising and my children sometimes say, you wouldn't believe it, I was in Sydney and I saw your work on the wall of somebody's house and I thought, they wow. said, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah, it is. So. Now, I know you've got an exhibit coming up, the mm. Stella's Nostalgic Art Exhibition at the yes. Community Gallery in Darcy Doyle Place, yes. opening on Saturday, July the 26th. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're showing there and what that event is about? Yes, well I haven't done, I haven't done an exhibition for a long time for financial and you know time restraints and things, um, but I got this idea over the Christmas holidays. My grandmother left me these beautiful um, National Geographics of the 1920s oh. and I was so inspired by some of the pen and wash commercials. Yeah. You know, and they were so simple, so few lines and so mm. expressive. And so during the holidays when I wasn't teaching or doing anything else, I did a lot of drawings and then I thought maybe I could yeah, so yeah. I, I met a nice framer who's put some of them into print for me and I thought, oh, gee, this is an opportunity. Absolutely, so yeah. So from there we've developed and now I've got three other artists who are my students who are oh, going to exhibit with me. One's a Sri Lankan boy of 17 who does the most beautiful portraits and oh, elephants and things. They, you know, they come out of the page at you. They're just, yeah. mind you, he spends months doing them. He's very meticulous. That's brilliant. And I've got another lady who does beautiful horses horses and one who does the African people you know she's got this amazing woman with a baby on her back and it's all black and white except for the red sash wow and it's so stunning oh well and you know you can see the wrinkles on her face you can see <laughs> the whole personification of her absolutely They're well that'll lovely. be su such a beautiful thing to go yeah. and see look if you want more information about the ex exhibition or anything else about Stella's work please do head to our website for more information thanks for being thank on the you. show today Stella thank you my pleasure Festivals are a big part of many communities around South East Queensland and Ipswich holds its annual festival in May. This week we took our cameras out around the city to capture the life and colour of festival season. The Ipswich Festival 2014 has come to an end but its positive impact on the city is still shining bright. Our field reporter Eliza Wheeler caught up with the festival's coordinator Paul Kasos to chat about this year's festival. Paul Kasos, can you tell me a little bit, bit about the significance of the festival to the people of Ipswich? 
Well, you know, the Ipswich Festival gives us an opportunity to be able to invite local people to, to uh, participate in an activity that will make them feel good about their city. And the Ipswich Festival now has been going for about 16 years. And uh, over the 16 years, many thousands of people who've come forward, performed at our festivals, and just have a great time. And that's what it's about. And how does the Ipswich Festival help out the local businesses? Well, I think what it does is it gives a great economic benefit, particularly here in the CBD area, to our local traders. And uh, most of the events we do are focused here on the CBD, so all of the retailers in this area, they benefit from it. This year we've got about 65 corporate sponsors on board, and uh, that gives those people an opportunity to have their name exposed in the public, and also gives the public an opportunity to know those businesses that have uh, a community spirit. And uh, I think that's uh, a great example of uh, the community and the business community working together. And can you tell me a little bit about what goes into planning an event like this? Well, we uh, really don't stop from the previous year, but uh, we put about six months full-time work into it. And uh, what we try to do is to embrace as many community organisations as we possibly can. And we're always looking towards new events as well. But uh, this year, we've got a hang of a lot of uh, new events on board. I'm trying to think how many events we've got. We've got that many of them. But uh, uh, an enormous amount of work goes into them. We've only got a very small staff, so it's all hands on deck. And it is very cold and windy today. Do you find that that stops the crowds from coming in? Well, let's hope not. Uh, we've uh, got our fingers crossed and the wind will die down for tonight. But one of my favourite events is the parade. And uh, when we see that this afternoon, that's the one that brings tears to my eyes when I see all the little children participating in it, the mums and dads and grandparents cheering them on. And I think that's a great example of a community in action. The annual street parade went off with a bang as crowds formed around the gates to watch the floats and entrance pass by under the theme of Aussie icons. Vendors of the Street Parade enjoyed their first experience at the festival. We are Archive Vintage. We have a retail vintage store in Seven's Paradox and we've been there for a couple of years now. Um, we were invited to come up here to the Ipswich um, 60s London Calling Festival. So we thought it was a good opportunity to sell a bit of our clothing and sort of get the word out about our store. Whilst others return for yet another year. We usually have a craft show with the Ipswich Festival. Uh, yeah, just to, to bring um, people in here and um, support the festival for such people. Festival goers, let us know what's great about the Ipswich Festival. Um, mainly the events and like when we have the parades and the bands and the entertainment, the different foods, and it, it's just great. It's just a really buzz about Ipswich because people think it's a, a backward place, but it's just so far ahead and advanced. It's just a great place to be. And what they were most excited for. Usually we go to the Jazz Wine and Blues Fest, that's on tomorrow night. But yeah, it's good for the kids, we always bring the kids down for a look. Well, my favourite part of the festival is actually tomorrow, which is uh, blues and jazz and wine down at Queen's Park, and that's good. <laughs> Overall, the annual festival was a huge success for festival goers, vendors and performers alike. Isn't it wonderful to see celebration going on in the community? Stay with us after the break for handy tips on caring for your pool this winter. Stay connected. Welcome back. 
It's getting a little too nippy for those late night dips in the backyard pool, so I am joined by Managing Director for Jim's Pool Care, Brett Blair, to give us some handy tips on caring for your pool this winter. Welcome to the show, Brett. Hi, Tammy. Lovely to have you here. Now, tell me, in winter time, we sort of neglect the backyard pool a little bit because it's too cold, we don't want to sort of deal with it. Why is it important to take care of your pool during winter? Yeah, well, what we've found over the years in uh, dealing with pool owners in winter is um, they run a bit of a false economy. They think they should shut the pool off, mm -hmm. let the pool go green over winter, fire it back up in spring when it's time to swim. The problem with that is there's a couple of, uh, couple of issues. One, it costs a lot of money to bring back a green pool. So a green oh, wow. pool recovery could cost anywhere between three and $500. Wow. Um, two, uh, it's not nice to have a, a, a toxic green pool <laughs> in your backyard when you're inviting the visitors over for a barbecue in the middle of winter. That's it. Absolutely. Now, what, what is a way that they can actually stop their pool from going green over the winter time? Yep, so some tips I'll give you today. Uh, um, definitely continue to test your pool water throughout, uh, throughout winter. Mm -hmm. uh, two, you can start to adjust timers and chlorine mm -hmm. output because there's not as much demand for chlorine, so you can reduce your running times. Yep. But don't reduce it so much so that the pool still may actually go green. Yep. Um, and the third thing is if you're not sure, um, get a professional out. So someone like uh, Jim's Pool Care mm -hmm. or go to your local pool shop uh, and ask for some uh, advice from them. Yeah, great, fantastic. Now, uh, tell me, when it comes to pool safety, obviously during the summer months we're all very on key and very aware of pool safety with fences and things like that. Is it just important during the winter time for those safety mechanisms to be in place and ensure they're, you know, accurate and safe? Yeah, definitely. So the um, Queensland State Government and a lot of the uh, state governments around Australia have had a real big push on pool safety in the last couple of years, mm. uh, bringing in mandatory inspections uh, for people selling properties and renting properties. Yeah. But the problem with winter is that we're not really looking at the pool area. So little maintenance things like gates opening and closing, yeah. uh, tree branches starting to hang over um, uh, fences, etc., yeah, can sure. be overlooked. Mm -hmm. So we'd say as a pool owner, definitely um, regularly go out and, and, and check your barriers, check, check that the gates close yep. um, and just do those little maintenance things that you'd probably would ignore usually in winter, but maybe this season, get out there and have a look. Yeah, absolutely, no worries. Now tell me, tell me a little bit about Jim's Pool Care. What, where did the business start? What, what, what's your involvement with the business? Tell me a little bit about your background. Yep, so um, I own Jim's Pool Care nationally and work closely with Jim Penman, the founder of the Jim's Group. Yeah. He now has 3,000 franchisees. Um, I've got around 70 uh, franchises around the country, wow. mobile pool shops, yeah. um, and we've got about 25 here in South East Queensland. Yep. So the services we offer primarily are two, there's two main sort of services. One's a casual call out service mm -hmm. um, for you know pool equipment breakdowns, one off uh, clean ups of pools, mm -hmm. etc. The second one's a regular service program. Yep. And we recommend that for people who are, you know, um, highly busy or mm. they have uh, young families with children and they want to make sure the pool's always safe to swim in. So the regular maintenance program means we come out every two, three, four weeks, yep. test and balance the pool, adjust timers, uh, backwash filters, clean baskets to make customers' life easy. Yeah, that yeah. sounds brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely. Now you've got a website with all of those details so that anybody watching the program at home can actually access those services, is that right? Yes, definitely. So yep. it's uh, jimspoolcare.com.au. Uh, you can book online or you can call us uh, six days a week on 131546. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Brett, for joining us. To wrap up our show, we have musical guest Rachel Mack from the Wind Up Dolls. She's the singer-songwriter whose solo performances have been described as seasoned and powerful and have taken her around the world and back. Their self-titled album, The Wind Up Dolls, will be released later in the year, details of which are available on our website. Rachel is here now to perform Your Best Will Do, but first we'll ask her a few questions. Thanks for joining us today, Rachel. Oh, thanks for having me. No worries. Can you tell me a little bit about your band, The, the Wind Up Dolls, and a little bit about the song that you're performing for us today? Yeah, no problem. Uh, I guess the band is the brainchild of myself, uh, the songwriter, and, and Marty Smith, who's a drummer and producer. Uh, and uh, this is our second album. We've uh, The first album we've toured most of Australia, apart from parts of WA, uh, kind of doing the hard yards, getting in the in the van and, and trooping around the country and playing every 
little uh, place from, from here to Wagga Wagga and back again. <laughs> and uh, this, this song is actually uh, written a, a couple of years ago at a festival that we were doing. And uh, I guess it's a love song. Mm-hmm. It's um, really just, just processing how, how you can just love somebody no matter what, just uh, as long as they're genuine. That's beautiful. Really looking forward to hearing it. Oh, thanks. Can, can you tell me a little bit about your background and in music and, and what's brought you to the place where you are now? Yeah, sure. Um, it's been a bit of an adventure. I, uh, I started performing uh, professionally when I was 17, sneaking into bars and, and clubs um, around actually this local area and, um, and playing, sneaking in behind the band with a Rhodes case, hoping no one would check my ID. And... Uh, I guess I'm um, kind of doing the hard yards. Uh, I've been overseas uh, to the States and uh, to parts of Asia as well. Spent a lot of time in China, just, um, you know, doing uh, lots of professional work, trying to refine, you know, how I play. Um, I did a degree in something else and I supported myself by um, playing music at night wow. and uh, just never really stopped. Um, and I guess as a songwriter, you take those adventures and all the different things that you do and... and um, hopefully roll them into little interesting observations about the world. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds fantastic. Well, I'm very much looking forward to hearing you perform, so I'll leave you to it. Thanks, Rachel, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today. Special thank you to our guests Stella Gibbs, David Morrison, Brett Blair and Rachel Mack from the Wind Up Dolls. For more information about anything you've seen on today's program, you can head to our website, connectedtv.com.au. I'm your host, Tammy Lindy, and I'll see you next week when you can stay connected.
the abyss.